Hello, good morning, and welcome to today's Industry Week webinar, Winning the War for Talent, How to Train and Retain Your Frontline Workforce, sponsored by Tulip. I'm Robert Schoenberger, Editor-in-Chief of Industry Week. I would now like to welcome today's speakers. Jessica Yen is Head of Global Success at uh, Global Customer Success at Tulip. As Head of Glo Global Customer Success at Tulip, Jessica leads the adoption management and customer service teams. She's passionate about manufacturing and using digital tools to help manufacturing companies drive measurable impact and cultural transformation. And Brian McGarvey is Strategic Accounts Manager at Tulip. In this role, Brian partners with uh, general manufacturing customer stakeholders to enable the adoption of Tulip for the enterprise at the, at the enterprise scale, maximize value creation from the Tulip platform, and ensure overall customer success. For more information about our speakers, check out the speaker details to have on your console. Welcome to you both, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Robert. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. So, as Brian mentioned, my name is Jessica. Brian and I are going to split out this presentation. We'll try to not keep the entire thing, us running through slides the entire time. We'll make sure there's time for Q&A toward the end. It's broken up into three main sections. So I'll be taking you through some information on the current state of the global manufacturing workforce, some themes that we'll speak to, and then we'll get into how can we change the cycle of having to constantly hire talent, train them, and try to retain them as opposed to losing them. Brian will pick that up and take us through the rest of the way. For context, I know some of the people here coming directly from production are probably less familiar with the concept of customer success. It's a technology company's specific function, but Brian and I have both worked quite extensively, extensively with manufacturing companies, both at Tulip and beforehand. And I started out as a supervisor and quality engineer. So we've, we've pulled all of that together along with what we've seen at Tulip. I'm gonna get started with current state of the global manufacturing workforce couple slides on some major themes you want to point out. So this first slide starts with the statement that manufacturing workforce is changing. It's a broad statement, but what we're the two things that we want to focus on are the generational turnover and the differences in the younger generations coming into the workforce, as opposed to a lot of the current generation that's in the workforce and potentially looking toward retirement and leaving. The younger workers coming in are tech savvy, right? So these are the folks who have grown up with smartphones, they're used to having an app for everything. Their expectations of tools that are available to them are pretty high. If you think about the apps that are available, everything from like Grubhub, things you can swipe on to order pizzas, they're expecting to have a great user experience, clean UIs, and technology that works for them. And somewhat unfortunately, that expectation is quite different than the current state of a lot of manufacturing shop floors. This is potentially a US-centric view right now, thinking through a lot of shop floors I've seen in the relative recently last few years, still heavily paper-based, writing things on paper, pen and paper, papers get dirty, they get machine oil on them, they're hard to read. So all of that creates this sort of dissonance and distance between what a younger generation is interested in coming in to do and the environment that exists today. Younger workers are also expected to change jobs more often. You may have heard that it's true in other industries. This is not a manufacturing specific comment that in general, the newer generations expect to change their careers f more frequently than older generations have. So this drives different needs for onboarding, documentation, almost an expectation that some workers will not stay as long. So we've established for the workforce wants and cares about different things. They'll also come in with different skill sets than previous generations. And we're coupling this with the way that people work is changing. So thinking about large scale changes in manufacturing and in industry and how that affects what workers are looking for. There's three things we're gonna cover. The first one being digital transformation. It's a word that's been thrown around. I'm sure you've all heard it a lot everywhere. It's not a new concept. It's been around for decades. Arguably, it started in different places. We've seen it mentioned in different places, but the concept of bringing digital tools to a workplace, whether it's manufacturing or not, so that people have better data, ideally tools that can give help them make better decisions and faster, is what we're talking about. There's a statistic we were looking at at some research earlier on, there are about 30,000, It's so it's somewhere in the very large double-digit number of SaaS companies in the United States. If you were trying to think about how many SaaS companies serve manufacturing, you could probably count them. It's very few. It's a relatively nascent space. So the manufacturing space has been traditionally underserved by technology. Technology has 
advanced significantly. A lot of other functions have benefited from it. Consumers in their everyday life have benefited from it. But manufacturing is still working in sort of the dark ages, if you will, of older technology. And they really haven't been able to benefit from a lot of the new technology that's come out. The next thing on the hybrid work environment refers to workers wanting flexibility when it comes to where and how they work. I think we, we all saw a lot of that come through in the last couple of years through the pandemic. Um, that the conversation on where the future of work occurs, whether it's in person, whether it's remote, is arguably just starting. It's been going on for a few years now. But the implications this has to manufacturing is people think about going to work, quote unquote, differently than they used to. They are aware that work from home is a concept and it exists for some jobs and it may not exist for others. And manufacturing for the primary part of the job is a very much physically present activity. Engineers might be able to do some work remotely, but even if you're a manufacturing quality engineer, at some point you're going to need to be there on the shop floor. So th their expectation of what they might be able to get in different industries, different jobs, and expectations for flexibility are different. And then the third point we wanted to point out here was gro growth trajectory, how important it is for workers to want to know what their development opportunities are in their roles. So with the context of they expect to switch careers more frequently than other generations have, they don't have the, let's say, loyalty and intention of loyalty to a single job because they don't need to. Unemployment rates are low. They know that they can change jobs more frequently. There's not necessarily a thought of, I'm going to stay at one company for the duration of my career. It's more important for them to know how they can progress their career at a certain company. And something I meant to mention earlier is the U.S. Bureau of Labor had a statistic run relatively recently, so end of last year, December timeframe, that the unemployment rate in the manufacturing sector was just under 2%, it was 1.8%. It's extremely low. And the report that we were looking at stated that this is the lowest unemployment rate on record for the manufacturing sector since 2000. So it is a tight labor market and it's extremely competitive. All right, so move forward with a little more stat information on statistics on state of the current manufacturing workforce. We're showing results from a survey that Deloitte did. They surveyed over 100 executive senior leaders in the manufacturing and operations space. And about a third of those leaders stated that retaining high-performing employees, as it says on the slide, is a strategic priority for 2023. And we thought that was interesting to call out because for any company, retaining high-performing employees should always be a priority. It's always something that people think about. But the fact that it's a strategic priority points to how tight the labor market is, how competitive it's becoming, and how important the employees that you do have are to making the company work. So there's a little more detail down below that 75% of them said their top challenge included retaining the existing workforce that they have. And we're going to get into this more on you can imagine people who have been there a long, been at a company for a while, they know the ins and outs of it. There's probably tribal knowledge they've accumulated, even if you have good documentation and they're bridging and making connections between people, finding the right talent. So as the work environment changed, we talked about digital transformation, new tools coming in, data is different. The skill sets you need to run your company, especially on the shop floor with more data available, are different than they used to be. So finding the right talent is hugely important. And then from there, some pretty standard HR ones on maintaining competitive wage and benefits packages, et cetera. We've got this for numbers, and we also have the results of the poll that Industry Week set out for this webinar, showing the results. And I'll let you read through them, but I want to highlight is most people said that the biggest labor challenge for this year is everything that's listed here, mostly training new employees quickly and efficiently. And Fortunately, we're, you're talking to folks from a software company who have tools to be able to help with that. So we'll speak to some examples for how tools can be used to help train new employees quickly and efficiently. There's also improving worker engagement. We'll talk a little bit of that as well. And then people have mentioned seasoned workers leaving, hiring new talent. There's I, manufacturing. I feel like when I was there quite a while ago, we had issues with certain generation leaving and taking an enormous amount of expertise 
you know, how knowing whether a machine is running because of the way the coolant and the tool sound hitting the material, like people with that level of expertise leaving. And how are you going to place that with younger folks who wouldn't be able to spend the next 20 years of their life listening to this machine and knowing whether or not it was producing good parts? So trying to bridge some of those gaps and create a more robust process, we can get into that as well. Yeah. And just to add in, Jess, like, you know, I think we have a pretty unique position where we get to work with, you know, hundreds of different customers. Um, but what was great, I mean, what was interesting to see is like, I don't think we were surprised by the results of this, right? Like this is something that is not unique to the group that, you know, this group here that responded, like this is something that um, would would likely be, you know, if you across the manufacturing base, it's, it's not unique to this group. So we'd love to, you know, have a conversation later in the Q&A about, about this as well as kind of the, the ways that you can combat it. 100%. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. So that makes people feel better. You're definitely not alone in being worried about some of these things and knowing that they're challenges and they're also not easy to fix, right? Training new employees, we can give you tools to do it, but you still need people out there to help get it done. All right. Last major slide in this section is talking about the competition for talent. So I already mentioned the unemployment rate being extremely low in the manufacturing sector, which already drives um, competition. And then some other stats we wanted to share were that uh, U.S. employee turnover, so it is U.S. specific, but in the manufacturing workforce, it was about 40%, which is enormous. If you can imagine, I've got 100 folks on the shop floor, you know, staff maybe across three ships, shifts, and year over year, 40 of them have to get retrained and leave throughout the year and get replaced. That's an enormous number. It both is a toll on your existing workforce to train people, but it obviously, you, it's obviously disruptive to actual you know, staffing, running your operations as well. So high turnover rates exist, shorter job tenures. We've mentioned that already with folks coming into the workforce, not expecting to stay there as long. Um, mentioned it, manufacturing has low unemployment. The light blue box mentioning 3X is referring to the median tenure of workers. So workers ages 55 to 64 were three times the median tenure of those workers were three times that of younger workers. You might be thinking, okay, well, they're older than the younger workers, so it would make sense that their te median, median tenure is longer. But an interesting related number to that was, I think something like 40 or 50% of the workers in that 55 to 64 type range had been at their company 10 years or more. And what will that number be when the current 25 to 34 year olds are 55 to 64? It may be significantly less than 10 years of service, or it could be that the percent of people who have been in a role for that long or a company for that long is much shorter. So expecting that workers to turn over more, you're going to lose people who know ins and outs, and you really need to rely more on like robust process, having things documented, having good data. All right. So main takeaway here, workplace expectations of the new generation has changed significantly, and the implications to manufacturers are that we need to change as well. And ultimately, that should be for the benefit of the manufacturers. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next section, which is breaking the cycle, how to augment, engage, and upskill your workforce. A couple slides here. First one, to get terminology out, digital augmentation. So the statement here is it empowers organizations to break cycle of having to constantly recruit and train new talent and then have them leave. When we say digital augmentation, we're referring to digital tools augmenting people, but augmenting in the sense of humans on the shop floor should be given tools that make that help them do their jobs more efficiently, not less efficiently. I'm going to get into a little bit more of that on the next slide, but it is empowering the people to be more efficient at their tasks. And when we say more efficient, we don't just mean do more work faster, like produce more in a shorter amount of time without much else. It's taking away those non-value add tasks that they maybe had to do before. Like I have to write down, you know, a certain parameter, a certain measurement for every widget that I'm measuring. I have to write down like the caliber, the caliper calibration dates, you know, in three different places on my workshop order before I can move the part forward. Some of that stuff we're talking about giving humans tools that can make their jobs focus on those value add tasks. And the human centric approach, I'm really going to get into more in the next slide about having these tools focus on what does the person using them actually need and how can that help those people make more informed decisions and then also create a continuous improvement type atmosphere. All right, next slide. We've got this chart, process-centric versus human-centric. What does that mean? 
Traditionally in large static systems that were implemented in manufacturing, MES manufacturing execution systems being a main obvious one, they were fixed. So you set them up, there's a complex data structure in the back, there's quite a bit of logic flows. They're pretty robust if they're done well, but they're relatively immobile. So I'm sure many of you either have or have seen this type of system in a shop floor where in order to input the data that you need to input, you got to click in 20 places, the data goes somewhere, you don't really know where it goes, you don't know how to get the data out of the system. And then also, depending on what your process is, if you need to change the process, say you add a step or like you get a new inspection piece of inspection equipment and now you know you cut out a bunch of steps, but you have new inspection data that you didn't have before and you want to capture it. You probably, you may not be able to use that system to do any of that. You, you're having to force fit your process into what the system is already configured to do, whatever data it can manage. And if it can't manage certain data, you're probably making an Excel or like a paper track. I used to do this with my operators all the time to get quality data. I would just print out paper trackers for them, make them write the stuff down. Then I would take it to my desk, put in Excel and figure out whatever analysis I wanted to run. And so you're force fitting what you have to do around these tools. And that's a process centric. That's what we refer to as process centric type systems because they're catering to the data and the machine, but not really what humans actually need. The human centric view of this on the right hand, what we're seeing with that is the tools and the systems need to be serving the people that are using them to make it more efficient. And in my head, I've said to folks is when I say this, what I see in my head are a bunch of tool paths that I've seen across many different customers at Tulip where we will actually cater and change and encourage customers because they can configure things themselves to change what a Tulip app screen does or what it shows based on where an operator physically is in the process. So at step A, if someone's assembling something, they may need a bunch of inputs to say, all right, what are the serial numbers and batch numbers and lot numbers of everything I'm assembling? But say at some later step, someone's doing something with their hands and gloves. They want you know as little interaction with having to click anything anywhere as possible. Maybe they need a foot pedal to advance to the next screen if they're being shown work instructions. And we will show the person at that step very different things than the person doing a bunch of assembly because that's what makes sense to help those people do their work effectively. So that's what we mean by the difference between a human centric and process centric systems. Yeah. So dovetailing on what Jessica has mentioned, you know, our the key theme here is that manufacturers really need to adapt to ensure those types of workers are engaged. And the way that we think about it is that there's really kind of maybe two main buckets of, of workers. Really that you kind of have salaried workers that might be more in line with you know your continuous improvement engineers, your advanced manufacturing engineers. And you know, the framework that we think of is like, they really want to be able to have the tools to take things to the next level, right? Like intrinsically, like they want to help improve their workplace. They want to help improve the operations for what they're trying to do. And they really need to be empowered to innovate and drive creative solutions to the, to the issues that, that they know exist on their shop floor. Um, they will also want to be able to implement those changes quickly. So as Jessica was mentioning, you know, that human centric process, like getting that, op that feedback from the operators and being able to implement it like within minutes, right? Not having to wait for, a central team, a central IT driven team to, you know, put in a ticket, then eventually get, you know, get that, um, get those changes updated, you know, a month when they, a month down the road when they eventually have time, like you can implement those rapidly yourself still within a framework of like approvals, but like, that's the type of power that they really want. And ultimately like embracing digital solutions to, you know, utilize them and scale them across, you know, across the entire factory or, a, or, or network of factories at, at enterprise scale. Kind of the other bucket of work of people that we kind of think about is hourly workers. So typically, um, most likely, you know, the people that are on your assembly lines making the widgets um, on your shop floor, and you know, again, kind of like an intrinsic value of like wanting to provide, you know, value or, or understand that they made an impact for you know what they're doing and like what they're doing, you know, eight ten hours a day, and really thinking through like the empowerment of you know being able to know the expectations for the job that they're assigned and how you know how is success actually defined for for that day um another idea is being able to like rotate through you know the different jobs that they're supposed to do and have like a, a systematic way of doing that and understanding like hey you know i'm not doing the same the same job each day but there is like a, a rotation of jobs and like there's a, a method to the madness and, and an understanding of like how that actually works and then this third bullet point is kind of this ex you know, experiencing what we call gamification or other reward structures that highlight the value of their work. You know, all of these concepts, digital tools can can like help in enforce this. But ultimately, like another common theme is leveraging modern tools and technologies 
that you know we brought up as like a, a current theme like that expectation of people being able to use current digital tools is just changing within the workforce All right i got an anecdote to share related yeah, to sure. things on the salaried workers so my bachelor's in aerospace and defense and this information is a little pre-covid so it's not that old but there is an enormous issue with aerospace and defense traditional players getting young engineers who graduated with aerospace engineering degrees to join their companies versus go to Facebook and Microsoft and Google. Everyone was going to tech. And some of that resonates with manufacturing because there are folks with industrial engineering degrees or any sort of technical degree that probably could come and be a great industrial manufacturing engineer. But you're now competing with tech companies like they have the right basis to go learn how to code if they want to or go do something else technical. So creating an environment to attract that kind of talent it was, again, one of the themes, but it it's definitely not a problem only manufacturing sees. And it's a bit widespread, but interesting to see right now. Yeah. So one of our like one of our perspectives is, you know, what what do both salaried and hourly workers actually care about? You know, we have a perspective of like making an impact and seeing the value of the work. That's you know, that is not unique to manufacturing, but that's also just, you know, that is kind of like a, a what I think we would all argue is kind of like a, a fact for most people, you know, in the workforce that being able to see the impact and seeing the value of their work um, is important. And as Jessica mentioned, you know, we're now competing with other industries that are competing, we're competing for talent in other industries where, you know, impact and value of their work might be more prevalent or might be more systemic in other in these other industries. So like, how do we bring that into manufacturing? So developing, you know, one of the one of those ways is developing a continuous improvement culture that really drives engagements so that, you know, is training workers more efficiently and effectively. So that's updating training processes and having an actual ability to update training processes, make it more engaging as opposed to, you know, just, you know, it's some archaic training process, you know, on a line, you know, all over in a corner. But how do you actually make that into an effective training process um, and being able to build out quality and compliance documentation in an effective and efficient manner? that is engaging and relevant to the, the people that are going to be consuming that. And then retaining the employees more, more effectively. And so one of the ways that we're going to talk about is defining, you know, standard work processes and feedback loops, as well as, you know, being able to use skills matrices to track progress and set expectations for those workers. Again, helping just to, to helping to change culturally, um, you know, what we see in manufacturing uh, pretty prevalently in terms of like con continuous improvement. Another kind of key theme here is like training management um, and execution, you know, outside of digital solutions, right? Like the basic concepts of training management of like defining the capabilities, tracking the training status. So skills matrices, um, defining refresher training, having just in time training, um, you know, those are just those are basic training concepts outside of digital. But when you do have digital tools, like it, it is much easier to implement, maintain, and make those more engaging for the workers. Again, from a from a business standpoint, much easier to maintain, but also for the expectation of the workers that are engaging with this, it's just a medium in which they actually want to uh, interact with. Um, so just a, another thing that we wanted to highlight. So this last section here is how to make workers your competitive advantage. And so we're gonna start this off with a quick survey do your front frontline workers have tools to help them contribute to continuous improvement? Kind of the first one is no. <laughs> our our team's uh, continuous improvement ideas are, are ad hoc and captured inconsistently, mostly on paper. Second one is somewhat uh, leveraging some digital tools, but could use them more effectively. And then the third is yes, you know, perfect. Uh, we have tons of digital tools in place and designed uh, to streamline the process of capturing and sharing and implementing ideas. Not surprising, but you know the about half, actually exactly half, you know, is kind of somewhere in the middle to to this question of are there digital tools over a third or, you know, no, um, kind of mostly paper based. So I would say that that's not probably out of line to what to what we see um, within our customer base, at least when they engage with Tulip. You know, there certainly is some some sort of digital tools out there. I think what I would I would argue is a lot of that is is for processes and not necessarily training or, or things like that. But again, it's kind of a, a mixed bag. Um, but again, also not not surprising that a good portion is, you know, no continuous improvement ideas or, or mainly, on, mainly on paper. I don't want to take away from the next slide, but uh, for context on why we're asking this, ability to contribute to continuous improvement culture is really important to workers. Like folks that I used to work with in pretty much every shop that I worked in, 
the ones who were engaged were the ones who had ideas on how to fix things, right? Like, I want to do the shadow board for my station. I want, I have an idea for how we can change this process. And being able to show that there's a way for them to contribute those ideas and that you can implement them and then track that is extremely powerful to help work for workers stay engaged and feel like they're creating value. So I just think it's a theme that we're going to keep seeing, but not surprising, as Brian said, that what the current state is. Yeah, I think for a lot of new new grads that kind of go into manufacturing, at least when they're first exposed, you know, at least this is, you know, maybe maybe a wrong expectation, but I, my expectation was certainly somewhere somewhere on the left, you know, for the current state of manufacturing prior to actually, you know, going to shop floors and, um, you know, super sleek, you know, sexy autonomous, you know, there's a lot of robots everywhere, things moving. But I think what most people would agree is that the reality is somewhere closer to the right, um, very paper-based, you know, paper, you know, very paper-based. Um, again, it's, it's not a whole lot of computers. Um, and the expectation is versus reality is kind of a, a, a pretty big divide. And, you know, if we do get, you know, those types of people that are, you know, very talented that want to make improvements that we want, in our, you know, that we want in our organizations, you know, that divide can be frustrating and ultimately, you know, cause people to, to leave, especially on like the engineering stamp, engineering front. So it's certainly a gap that, you know, we all know that we need to address and, and one of the reasons why we're discussing here. And some of the questions that you kind of need to ask yourself when you're evaluating your shop floor, and this is, again, this is not specific to, to digital, this is more around just, just holistically, is three, three questions that we believe are pretty important. One's around understanding targets. Like, if, you know, if you were to go out um, and speak to your workers on the shop floor, do you think they know their goals for the day? Um, Oftentimes, when I visit customers prior to, you know, to, de to deploying uh, Tulip, and this is you know while I'm at Tulip as well as um, my my uh, previous experience in consulting, you know the answer was typically no, or it was I'm just here to make as much as I can, or I don't you know maybe like they might have like they may have a target, but they really don't know. They don't know if they're winning or losing the shift. They have no idea you know throughout the course of the day how they're how they're doing, and they're just kind of flying blind. The other the other aspect here is you know when you kind of have this idea of a feedback loop. So, and this is cultural too, as well as, as well as tool-based, um, you know, when was the last time somebody, a worker's feedback was implemented and how long did it take to actually implement it? If the answer to the question of the first question was, you know, it's somewhere it's like, Hey, you know, it's within the last, you know, week, month, whatever, it's really important to understand like how long did it actually take? Um, because then it also drives into the recognition of that closed feedback loop of, do you have a way to recognize employees who make that process improvement? Because again, that's, that's extremely important to, you know, from this cultural aspect of making sure that workers are engaged um, and feel, feel valued and feel that they're contributing. Um, you know, if you don't have that feedback loop to understand that somebody actually, you know, an idea that I brought forward and had this impact, if it, if it was implemented and they actually never got the, the notification or the feedback that, Hey, thank you, Jessica, for making that great idea you know, it's, it's almost lost, you know, and it's, it's not going to be kind of a, it's not going to be a sustaining process. So where can you get started? You know, there's these kind of maps of the previous, the previous area, but again, this is not directly related to digital at all. This is in fact, more of, um, more just holistically is from a cultural perspective of, you know, there's kind of a couple building blocks here that we'll build up to, you know, one is performance management. So empowering those workers um, to, you know, to understand their goals and have the visibility of like what they're doing for the day. And there's also that continuous improvement culture. So I said, like the feedback loops um, and being able to identify that there's that there's um, that there's issues um, and that if there are issues that identify that there's actually mechanisms for them to uh, that just to be improved. Um, you know, that's a continuous improvement culture that, you know, as we all know, is just kind of table stakes for um, for something that we that we want to accomplish. But building on that, you know, employee engagement, you know, if you can if you can nail those two, then employee engagement, you know, rises and you're empowering workers to innovate, um, which then we believe helps retain and attract talent, uh, which ultimately helps make a more competitive business, which then kind of feed back, feeds back into the other areas as well. Because um, we all know that, like, you know, obviously one of the goals of running businesses is to have more a more competitive business. And that's, you know, one of the one of the outcomes of you know, these first four building blocks here. Jess, anything else to add? Retaining and attracting talent is important. Having engaged workforce is important. There are things we should do as responsible employers to give people a great work environment. But ultimately, these are businesses, and we're doing this because we are trying to run a business. So all of these things should serve that end purpose. 
in a way that's still really respectful of the people. And performance management, ex- if, um, if I'm going to speak about that for a second, so the typical pillars of that, if you will, are have KPIs defined and people know what they are, have visibility to what they are. And a standard whiteboard version of this is like your hour by hour production tracker, right? Like what's the target for the ship shift, divide it into eight, if it's an eight hour shift, and then track how performance is going. And people can see in real time, they need to speed up or things not going well. Folks that I had when I was a supervisor genuinely felt pride when they did well on their shift. Like they could go home and tell their kids that day, like, hey, I did really well at work today. And people like having that kind of knowledge and information to bring back. This is a good bridge into what Brian's going to get into next, but lots of issues with hour by hour board on a whiteboard, right? People forget to fill it out. They fake the numbers. It gets erased. It's the wrong number. Like many reasons why digital can help here, but the concept is fundamentally the same and like how important it is to give people feedback in real time. Exactly. And so kind of now we're going to kind of shift into, okay, how can digital tools and digital solutions help kind of on this whole theme that we've talked about around retaining and attracting talent. And so we're going to dive into a couple of use cases here that, you know, that are sanitized examples from customers and they, you know, they're specific customer examples, but they resonate, the themes resonate across much of our customer base. And I think will resonate with, with the folks on this call today. Um, But between like a couple of use cases, like production tracking and visibility, digital guide workflows and quality defect tracking, like those are very core use cases that resonate with our customer base um, and, you know, within production visibility, as Jessica had mentioned, you know, obviously it's, you know, the, the old school version of this is like an hour by hour whiteboard. And that's not great at giving workers immediate feedback and understanding what, you know, are they actually winning or losing the shift um, or the hour? And so we've kind of divided this into kind of two, two aspects that are mapping back to the kind of the worker sentiment, but also like the business impact, you know, again, like that, that sixth, that sixth pillar, that fifth pillar around the, um, the bottom line. And so when you start implementing things like, you know, production visibility dashboards and hour by hour boards, you know, you're able to give workers immediate feedback if they're on track for hitting their targets. Um, a, a tool like Tulip, again, there's, there's many others, but you're also able to add, you know, include and on functionality to resolve issues quickly. And so remove that friction that a lot of people feel um, as they're in production. Um, So if they need maintenance on their machine, if they're out of parts, like being able to remove the barriers of having to go find Joe for the next two hours, you know, walking around trying to get get something resolved, you're able to remove that friction and also decreases manual data entry and all this data is retained. So one thing that we often hear from from workers is, hey, I, you know, I'm filling out my hour by hour you know, sheets of paper or on a board and it gets erased at the end of the day, or I'm filling up my quality sheet and it ends up in a binder somewhere. Like nobody actually can do anything with the data in the worst case, or, you know, somebody has to actually then go and input it into Excel. Like, like Jessica was mentioning back in her, you know, back in her time manufacturing, like at the end of the day, somebody's going and spending an hour to, you know, consolidate all this information, put it in Excel and it's still, you know, t- too late. It's at the end of the day, you weren't actually able to impact um, or course correct, which is kind of going to the second area of business impact. Like, when you have this real-time visibility, it actually allows managers to manage proactively versus reactively. And they're able to course correct throughout the day to actually meet targets. Um, I've seen this, I've talked to, I've seen this at our, at our customer deployments um, at Tulip. I've had line leaders come up to, a line leader specifically, one time I can mention is like, I, he came up to us and was like, I love having this tool. I can now see what is going on? I can see who is underperforming. I can see who's overperforming. I can go make, I can manage. I can actually go and understand what am I doing? And so there's a, there's a true impact on his, on his life, right? Because now he can have pride of like, Hey, I have one of the best running lines in, in our plant. Like he can actually have impact and have, you know, make an impact throughout his day, as opposed to at the end of the day, tallying everything up and just saying, I, I, you know, we'll try again better tomorrow. And that also trickles down to, you know, the workers, like they're able to have a manager that is engaged and in, in interacting with them. And again, that's that's way better than the alternative of just, you know, left your own devices, hope you make your targets. Um, nah, we didn't. Too bad. Try again tomorrow. Another use case, which is somewhat similar to kind of that production visibility, but, you know, more of like digitized, digitized workflows or digital work instructions is, you know, enabling workers to be more productive and, and understand their goals. But, you know, Imagine like if you have a more of a complex assembly, like, you know, workers are, are in, in this example, you know, workers are more guided um, through how they're supposed to assemble something. But again, you're still tracking like how much was made, how many defects, 
you're reducing the barriers for, you know, if you have issues, you're, you're able to call for help and you're able to get help uh, quickly. You're able to reduce those barriers of communication. Um, and you're also able to, you know, have, you know, from a business impact, you're getting that data and storing it. So you can historically analyze this and understand, you know, then, you know, you can understand like, and, and understand the implications of, of production runs and why things went poorly and make improvements for the future. Um, when in the past, what we often see of customers is like that data is lost. Another really cool example that I want to share is, is something that we recently implemented with, a with one of our global enterprise customers. A very simple use case is a uh, kind of this, what they what they dubbed as an MDI application, and, and they use it every day for their gimbal walks. And, and really, what the impact here is, it's a mobile application, or it's available on, our, on their tablets. But they have all of their supervisors out on the shop floor at the end of the day, going through going through their checklist, work, working with their teams, and they're able to input issues in real time or at the before the shift, and provide categorizations of who's the person in charge, what's the urgency, when is it due by, what's the category. You know, what's the requested action and take a picture of like, what is the issue? I mean, for, think, for example, as simple as something like 5S, like being able to take a picture and say, hey, you know, other person who is responsible for these types of things. Here's an issue I found. Um, I need to get fixed by this day. And then that person's then notified and is able to proactively go out and, and fix it and then take a picture and say, hey, this is what it looks like now. Like there is like there is true value in being able to say before and after in the state and then being able to say, OK, this is done. Um and I don't know if you guys can see this down here, but at the bottom of these of these a couple of different views, there's a, a checkbox for send the requester a notification when it's done. So when we talked about earlier in this presentation, like that feedback loop, something like digital tools is as soon as it's closed out, like the, the requester automatically gets all this information and said, it's you know, showing like, hey, this is how long it took, this is the corrective action, this is the before picture, this is the after picture. And there's like intrinsic value from um, being able to see like, Hey, I'm, I raised this issue and here's the impact of what it, what, like of what it actually had on the business. Again, 5S quality, you name it. There's like a ton of different categorizations. And if you take it up from another level, you know, at the entire, uh, factory site, like they're able to then now track and understand the issues that are being, that are being resolved and, and raised. And then from an enterprise perspective, you know, across a network of factories, like the implication is that like, you're also able to see how many issues are raised, whether it's safety, 5S, maintenance, quality, like there's like a, a different, a lot of different ways to slice and dice this. And, you know, as Jessica mentioned, you know, it's human centric. So the data that is on, you know, that we're presenting here is very, you know, can be very different for different enterprises. Again, it's, this is not a one size fits all. Um, it really changes based on, on the culture and the operators of, of who's interacting with it. <clears throat> to kind of round up the, the back end of this presentation here, so Stanley Black and Decker is one of our, our largest customers, and we have a great relationship with them. And I, I work closely with Antonio Hill, and I've been to a couple sites with him. Um, and something, you know, a quote that he made um, really resonates with with a lot of us here at Tulip. And you know, one of the key takeaways is that you know the people are the most important aspect. And I think it kind of goes back to kind of the expectation versus reality of of where we are with manufacturing. You know, we're not in a fully autonomous and you know state where robots are running everything and we're never I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon and arguably may not want to. So people are the most important aspect of our businesses. Um, and so how do we serve them and make make a culture and make a make an environment that they're you know that they want to interact with and 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 stay and stay at. So one of the deployments we have at, at uh, with Stanley Black and Decker is, is at a facility where they make um, all of their you know uh, toolboxes, metal toolboxes. And really good quote from from a gentleman named Oscar, who was an operator at that site, and um, one of the continuous improvement engineers at Stanley Black and Decker, um, what we call citizen developers. She saw that there were problems um, on their shop floor and built a series of scheduling applications. Um, and production tracking applications so the operators ultimately understand like, hey, what am I supposed to be doing? Uh, and how do I call for help if I need, if I need it? It's very simple, um, very simple concept, very simple applications. But this quote's really powerful. You know, before it was frustrating going through all the papers every day, all, all the missing parts were, we need. I met with Sophia, who was at Continuous Improvement Engineers at our Gemba meetings. And the day our Continuous Improvement Engineer introduced the application to us, it became so fast. For the future, I believe uh, that, that because of technology, it's going uh, to be a lot of improvements. 
so we've continued to work, you know, and worked with uh, with this site to, to continue to deploy Tulip in other aspects. And it's it's truly remarkable, you know, just from an adoption standpoint, when you go and visit these sites, like people want better better experiences, want better tools. Um, and so that's why we truly believe that, you know, this human centric approach of, you know, composable applications um, is is really fundamental to this this transformative change. Again, not to get buzzwordy and you know from digital transformation, but it's truly making it, you know, making solutions that resonate with the people that are doing the work, um, and not some process centric uh, solution. So to close it all out, today's critical themes were workplace expectations of the new generation of workers has changed, and so manufacturers need to change as well. Digital augmentation uh, empowers manufacturers to break the cycle of constantly recruiting and training the talent. And by cre creating repositories, connect applications tailored to your organization and your people, uh, you can drive employee engagement while be boosting productivity and ultimately you know, helping break that cycle of constantly finding new talent. Robert, I th think that closes it out and we'll move over Great. to you tonight. Thank you. It's a, a great presentation. A few of you have already submitted questions, so we'll jump right in. Before we started today, I said this topic, we're going to get a lot of questions, and uh, the audience here has not disappointed. Uh, but before we get to those, I just wanted to, uh, a couple comments about some of the things that uh, both uh, uh, both of you said, both uh, Brian and Jessica. Uh, you talk, uh, Jessica, you talked a lot about the younger people today have more career changes, and yeah, this is kind of the, one of these self-fulfilling prophecy starting in the 90s we started telling a lot of young people in high school be prepared to have eight or nine jobs throughout your career don't you you're not gonna be able to say and boy the teenagers actually listen for once and they really followed through with that and uh, there's been this cultural change uh, that we've we've all seen uh, but it does look like there are some signs that maybe that's slowing down a little bit the last couple of surveys i've seen have shown that uh, some younger workers are looking to commit to, to the longer terms at companies if they're like you mentioned given that growth trajectory given that sense that they can make a career out of one location and and we've seen a lot of that in work we've done with younger workers and uh, talking to people about talent uh, development and talent leadership in, in this industry so Great stuff on that side. Thank you very much for presenting it. All right, and uh, let's get to the first question. Uh, you mentioned just-in-time training as a way to improve training. Can you give an example of what that means and how, how that works on the shop floor? Yeah, so kind of the concept is, you know, let's say you're a manufacturer that has a couple hundred SKUs. It's not, you know, might not be, might not be exactly fit your, your operations, but it's certainly not in common with what we, what we see. Um, obviously, there's some SKUs that are high runners and some that, you know, you may run every couple months. The idea being that with a digital solution, Tulip being one of those, is that you can start to get visibility into knowing who's been involved with running those product, like that production, like those are certain SKUs. And if you have workers that are, if you're in a changeover on your line and you're getting ready to start running those SKUs, like just in time training means, well, I have a series of, I have an application or video work instructions that can be presented to the workers and the operators during that changeover. So they get trained on how to actually manufacture and produce and, and assemble, you know, whatever that widget is. So you're able to kind of meld like a, a, a skills matrix with digital work instructions and be very tailored and targeted in terms of like who gets that just in time training, whether it's completely new workers or, hey, it's just been three months since I, since we've done this before. Um, let's have a refresher course. Let's have a quick refresher training um, to kind of get us up on that learning curve. Great. Great. All right, the next question here, a technical one. What kind of device um, are, are what, what kind of devices are people using to access uh, the, these systems and display the data? For a tool specifically, there's a whole bunch of different apps or sort of devices that you can use. If you our knowledge base, it's I call it Wikipedia for Tulip. It's support.tulip.co. If you just type in display device, you'll get quite a bit of information on this. But everything from mobile phones work fine. Tablets obviously work fine. Regular PCs, laptops, desktop computers all work fine. It really doesn't matter. We've got Tulip will run on iOS and Android. So we have something called the player. It's a tool supported system um, that you can download. It's like downloading any normal .exe file and you install it. It's pretty straightforward to run and we're it's done that intentionally so that people have the flexibility in my example of someone at a certain line, depending what step you're at, they have different needs or your water spider has a different need. They're running around all day than someone who's working at a certain station. So we want to make sure they have the flexibility to use whatever device makes sense for them. 
Yeah, that's great. I mean, the, the, the days of hardware specific uh, systems seem to be really passing. So many companies have really adopted your approach of these technology agnostic uh, uh, ways of accessing the uh, information. So that's great. All right. Uh, so uh, next question here, what size uh, crew would this solution work for? Is there an optimal group size or a minimum that you often consider? No, it yeah, I don't know, Brian. No, we have, we have customers ranging from tens of thousands across the globe um, that we're, you know, we have deployments across, you know, across global enterprises. And it also works really well for, I don't know, the custom bike, man, bike manufacturer in Massachusetts, right, that, that makes, you know, high-end bikes, like, and everywhere in between, right? It works really well. And that's one of the things where you have this human-centric approach is that you, that you can compose applications very quickly, Um and you can then make a system of applications so you can build, you know, it builds and scales very, very quickly. Jessica, anything to add on that? Or? The only I think is if the person is thinking of specific examples, like you had that screenshot of what looked like a mobile aspect ratio app, are there certain crew sizes for that? So that's where, to Brian's point, human centric, the technology to serve the people. So if you have, say, it's a safety type related app and like the entire plant needs to have it and all your maintenance workers need to have it on their phone, you can make an app that can handle a lot more inputs, have the more robust data structures. If you have a very niche process, you need work instructions for like this very special welding process that is only done like once a month because of this random skew that comes in, you can make a different app for that. So the crew, it, the technology can be changed the UI, the logic behind it to serve whatever crew, whatever need and scope you have. And, and just a comment too about like, when we say like build an app, like the barrier for the barrier for building an application, I know I'm, I, some people in this audience might not know too, like it's it's equivalent to like building a PowerPoint, right? It's like very similar UI, UX, and like the changes that get, then get published to the shop floor is instantaneous. So it's not like some, some pro, it's not something that you spend days building, right? It can be very simple, um, simple applications that, you know, that can get published and deployed. Great, great. Uh, next question here, what are some specific ways you can recognize employees for process improvement ideas and strategies? There's a number of ones. Before we get into maybe like monetary, that sorts of things, just the recognition, people knowing that their ideas have gone somewhere, are being considered, and are contributing to actually making the workplace better, especially if their ideas make their own job better, right? Like, hey, every day when I need this tool, I have to walk across the shop, sign it out. It's like 20 minutes away from my station. And then like someone grabs me while I'm over there to look, to look at their part with them. And their suggestion is something like, hey, let's have like more localized mini tool cribs, you know, around the shop or whatever it is. Implementing something like that not only shows them that they're being listened to and their ideas are being heard, but you've actually just addressed a source of waste, right? Transportation, motion, you've taken that away. You've made the process in some ways more efficient because you should have less time doing value, non-value add work. So there's a couple different ways that that can go. I mean, that's just one example. I don't know, Brian, if you want to add anything. Yeah, like a really simple example is um, we're working with, I'm working with one of my customers right now. They're interested in developing a Kaizen funnel. Um, application. So collecting all these great ideas and then, you know, how do you, you will it down? I'll, I'll ultimately go through a lean steering committee. And like one of the points we made is, you know, that, that recognition. And so one of the ideas that they're thinking about is, you know, kind of a, a plant level, like almost not, not like a newsletter, but like having like recognition, like a formal process to like, you know, Hey, this is, you know, you know, Jessica had this great idea and like it saved, you know, part of like their Kaizen funnel is like, Hey, like what's the, what's the value? And like, you know, say like, Hey, we say like, he or she saved like this amount of money or like this, you know, reduced waste or whatever, whatever that metric may be. One of our other customers is doing something very similar where they have a, when you walk in, there's like the plant level KPIs dashboards for the debt, you know, for the last week, but they do have a section for recognition, you know, whether it's like the employee of the month, you know, that's not related next necessarily to Tulip, but if there's like great ideas or, you know, improvements that people have made, like there's recognition that the entire facility sees. And again, so it's kind of like that. Um, there is like a really good system and feedback loop. Um, yeah. that helps drive, it's almost like it's driving, it's like driving this improvement culture. D depending how big the improvement is, like we have had, I mean, we see this is common, right? There's some sort of swag people get like, hey, if you submitted an idea this month that was implemented or like the best idea, maybe there's a voting system amongst your peers, you get it might be something small, like a mug or something. There's ways to tear that up. If you have an idea that you can support getting implemented that has direct monetary impact, there could be something that's more related to like, hey, you get an extra day off or something because your idea is saving, you know, say X minutes per 
cycle time of whatever process. So there's other ways to think about it more creatively. And I think we've got the whole spectrum of simple, just pure recognition, giving people the visibility to what their peers and themselves are accomplishing all the way to doing stuff that costs money and probably needs to be managed with HR more. Yeah, definitely. And to, to your point, uh, Jessica, when you start this answer is that just having seen your, your ideas implemented is a huge reward in itself. People don't like wasting time, even if they're being paid for their time. Uh, people don't like watching, you know, you know wasting uh, their, their efforts doing things that don't seem to have much value. Uh, we, we ask that question a lot in our Best Plants Conference, uh, Best Plants Awards program, and we track how many suggestions companies implement for how many they get in and things like this. And if you really see the best performing plants are the ones that implement lots and lots of employee ideas. So it, it really does feed the entire system of, of manufacturing excellence. So we have time for just a few more questions here. Uh, let's see. Uh, what are some ways, uh, some tips to keep worker training materials up to date? It depends on what they are because and what resources you have. Because I know some plants ha still have a role called trainers. I've been in plants that used to have that role and due to cost cutting, no longer have that role. And then they're the ones who are like, no one's keeping training up to date. No one knows how to train anything, anybody anymore. Like no one can keep up with this stuff. So using digital tools, and th this goes back to having human-centric tools and how this makes you more efficient, can help you keep that up to date because it becomes much faster. You've already got things in place. And if you say, make a process change, and I'm go back to example, like you added a new piece of inspection equipment, or you want to change how a certain piece is inspected, and you need to take different pictures and add different you know, text for work instructions. And you're like, okay, now I got to update this in a PDF and replace everything on the shop floor and update my training material and like make sure that's updated in some document management system. There's a lot that can get lost there. But if you've got a, a concise digital tool that can say, all right, I update it here. I hit and tool it's called publish. You publish it. It gets pushed to the shop floor. Everybody now has the updated step, whatever it is. And if you wanted to, you could say for like the first week that it's out there, add like a, a flashing sign or something that says like, hey, new step here. Like make sure you get this training done. So there's a lot of ways that digital tools can help you push training out and get it done more quickly and efficiently, which would help you keep it up to date and take away that barrier. Great. I think we have time for maybe two questions here. Uh, focusing on the hybrid work environment, what kind of strategic learning um, and technology must be, uh, be implemented uh, to the workplace to make uh, hybrid workplaces work? Yeah, I, I think when, so when they're, they're probably referring to what we're mentioning hybrid of the ability, well, hybrid, like some at home, some in person. So probably less applicable to, say, a direct line operator doing assembly or working on a machine. But say you're a manufacturing engineer or something, can I do some stuff at home? And a lot of that's going to be, do they have access to the things they need to do their jobs? And having, so we mentioned SaaS and like the trend in SaaS-based tools, so things that are available over the internet. There is a lot more, and Tool being one of them, is a platform that's available online. So if they can connect into the network, if they have internet access, they should be able to access Tool. So if they need to update work instructions, they can from home. There's dashboards that they can see, and they can see say they're on the quality side and they are seeing defects come in, you can see that in real time on your dashboard and disposition them right in the comments, communicate directly with folks remotely. And it, maybe you're not even home. Maybe you're just in a different building in a meeting or something. And you've got that real time visibility and a way to address it on your phone, on your laptop. So having the right tools is important. And then having information that's accessible, this gets into like, if you have SOPs, they need to be in a place that someone could access from home. So there's some of that like technology infrastructure that makes this much more feasible. So 30 seconds or less, let's try to get this squeeze one more question in here. How can we start to make a shift from a process-centric approach to the human-centric approach? So your best elevator pitch for a quick response to that one. I would say start small because tool, I, I harp on this all the time. Piloting is so valuable to show something small and quick. So take a small process. I'm, this example I love because we had a customer who took did a very simple final inspection app, put it on the shop floor in two weeks from starting with Tulip, built it, started capturing data, and they found there was a huge difference in one inspector and how he was rejecting hardware, and it was a retraining issue, and they fixed it within a week. So start small. You might still have your process-centric systems in place. Like maybe you still have part of an MES and like some of other, other systems you have and that's still going, but you, in a certain place, start creating these human-centric type applications. And then eventually you can start cutting over and being like, okay, maybe we'll replace our MES with a more human centric system that still captures the data, but it's 
easier to pilot, start small, do smaller apps and get them on the floor and then get people accustomed to that way of working. 30 seconds exactly. That was perfect. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. I, I'd like to thank our speakers, Jessica Ian and Brian McGarvey, and our sponsor, Tulip. Thank you so much. I'm um, sorry we don't have more time to discuss a few more questions, but uh, our speakers will have a chance to read those questions offline and respond to you all individually. Uh, so thank you for your time today, and on a happy half of Industry Week. Have a productive remainder of your day.